Hello to all the listeners and welcome to CEC Guruku live lecture. Today I Dr. Ramna we will be discussing together a very important topic globalization to regionalization situating the changes in world politics. The focus of the lecture today will be it an attempt to understand the nature causes and consequences of regionalization its link with globalization and how it is leading to new kinds of changes in the world politics to begin with let's understand the trajectory of world affairs there was the end of the second world war cold war was an ideological war the world was divided into two hostile camps now when we talk about cold war in the world history it is important to understand that there was no actual war but it was like a ideological war the world was divided into two warring camps the united states that was the capitalist west the soviet union that was the communist east and with these two warring camps there was an attempt to grab more and more power to spread the ideology for example if united states came up with nato alliance soviet union came up with the warsaw pact the first phase of the cold war is remarkable that is it is it witnessed rise and rise of the cold war there were factors that really uh, led to heated ideological war and propaganda between the two camps of united states the capitalist west and the soviet union the communist east now with the, with the balkan crisis cuban missile crisis swiss canal crisis all of this was witnessed in the first phase of the cold war this was followed by the ten the ten signified thaw in relations that is cooling down of relations between us and ussr now the, there were many factors that contributed to the ten but irrespective of that with the afghan uh, with the so uh, in uh, soviet union invasion of afghanistan cold war came up and then of course uh, you know the last phase was the end of the cold war with the dissolution of soviet union and emergence of united states supremacy now we have to see that all the, the last phase of cold war is very significant for mapping regionalization and globalization both as a part of the structural change now there was the fall of the berlin wall in 1989 there was ideological division the of the world now this ideological division of the world which existed before the cold war this ended after the for you know the nearing of the end of the cold war there was collapse of soviet socialist unis 1991 and then post 1991 there was one definite move that was the new phase of globalization now regionalization and globalization in this paraphernalia they are both part of the structural change now what we see here is that there was the shift from bipolarity there was diffuse or multipolar structure in the post cold war era with the dissolution of soviet union and with the entire changes of collapse of eastern union communist regime we see that there is new division of power there is new global division of labor also and within this there are changed attitudes to liberal ecosystem economic development political system amongst others now what we see here is that uh, there is a new world order capitalist driven united states is the sole superpower and neoliberalism is creepingly making its impact felt in every sector of the society and economy china and eastern european countries too they witness change for example politically they may be china may be towards a communist closed system but on the economic front its economy with its diversified manufacturing base is much more uh, readyable much more 
open as compared to other. So within this new world order with the end of the Cold War and post-1991 leading to new globalization phase, capitalist United States as a new superpower and neoliberal ideas coming up, we have to see then the idea of globalization then is hotly and heatily debated. At the very outset, it's, let's make it very clear that globalization existed even in the past. But what is remarkable about the contemporary phase of globalization driven by neoliberal forces is its rampant reach, is its ability to you know, have its impact felt on every dimension of life, be it be political, social, economic or technological. So therefore, when we try to talk about globalization, there are a lot of variables attached to it. First, is globalization a confusion? Because there are so many interpretations to it. Then there is a debate that is globalization a myth? Then there are ideas that is it a rhetorical divide? Then of course, there are uh, remarks that globalization is a phenomenon marked by paraphernalia like free trade, open movement of goods and services, capitalism, liberal democracy, amongst others. Then there are remarks also, is globalization an ideology, that it is driven by ideas. Then there is a debate that is it actually reality? And of course, the, so there are also debates upon orthodoxy and rationality in the global process. So what we see here, you know, let me present to you an, a definition by Sorensen who defines globalization as intensification of economic, political, social and cultural relations across borders. Now, this definition is very important for us to understand because, you know, across borders communication in terms of movement of goods and services, movement of people, trade, etc. existed everywhere. But this time, this intensification of economic, political, social and cultural relations across borders is much more rampant and much more intensified. So what we see here is that, you know, let's trace down that how this intensification is important, is very significant because the economic realm, there is internationalization of production. There is increased mobility of capital. There is there are multinational corporations. There are transnational corporations. On the ideological level, there are investment and trade liberalization. There is deregulation. There is privatization. So when we look at these phenomena of economic as well as ideological, we see that globalization is making its impact felt. For example, the political level, there are debates that the power is being shifted from the state towards the market forces. At the societal and cultural level, there are debates of rise of new forms of hegemony that is namely westernization, Americanization amongst others. At the economic side, there is this entire debate of internationalization of production, increased mobility of capital and the rampant rise of a reach of multinational and transnational cooperation. At the ideological level, of course, there is a thing that there, you know, trade investment and trade liberalization, deregulation and privatization are having an impact on the way the structural basis of an economic process for any nation is formed. Now, dear listeners, it is essential for us to understand here that when we are trying to understand globalization in the world history, that is more than the geographical extension of a range of phenomena and issues, globalization is just not only about significant intensification of a global connectedness. Globalization is rather about a larger impact that it is having on every strata of society, every aspect of a phenomena and every layer of issues. So dear listeners, we have to see that consciousness of this intensification with a concomitant diminution in the significance of territorial boundaries. This is what this globalization, you know, try, is trying to have this kind of impact on the na uh, processes. Now, let's come to our next dimension that is the main focus of our argument that is regionalization. Now, regionalization, in order to understand regionalization, we thought that we'll have the basis of globalization that is how 
the process of intensification, the process of cross-border connect, that somewhere, you know, globalization gives us a glimpse inside for regionalization is integration within a given union. Now, there is, you know, undirected processes of social and economic interaction amongst the unit. Now, this regionalization is having a bearing on the larger setup of the world uh, affairs. That is how this unpresented processes of social and economic interaction amongst the unit are having an impact. Now, let me bring to you an example, a definition. This is by Whiting in his 1993 book. That is, continuing processes of forming regions as geopolitical units, as organized political cooperation within a particular group of states, and or as regional communities such as pluralistic security communities. All this uh, can be traced within the paradigm of liberalization which is significant part of regionalization too that today you know using geopolitics nations and states are coming together and they are having pluralistic communities pluralistic commu commitments that is namely variety of issues wherein nations across the borders try to try to cooperate with each other now uh, at the same time, you know, this very idea of proneness of the governments and people of two or more states to establish voluntary association and to pull together resources, that is material and non-material, and at the same time create common functional and institutional arrangements. Now, these are some of the ways and mechanisms within which regionalization comes up or that is within which gives the basis for regionalization to operate that is somewhere the governments of two or more states must be voluntarily accepting to run the governments and also at the same time pool resources that is material resources non-material resources and create common functional and institutional arrangements now uh, let's take some examples of regional in organization and institution one of the very significant examples of regional organizations are is North American Free Trade Agreement. You got it right that we abbreviate it as NAFTA. Now NAFTA is a three country accord. It has been negotiated by the governments of Canada, Mexico and United States. Now when we talk about NAFTA, you have to see that it came into force in January 1994. The focus of NAFTA has been liberalization of trade in agriculture, textiles, automobile manufacturing. And amidst all this, you know, when we look at the focus, we have to see that how today there have been debates on this trans-Pacific partnership as to how the current uh, United States President Donald Trump has cast a doubt on the trade-offs or the benefits NAFTA offered to the, all the three countries on a seen on a parity level. Then we have the other example of a regional organization that is ASEAN, Association of Southeast Asian Nations. Now this was established on 8th August 1967 in Bangkok, Thailand. Let's understand who are the founding members of ASEAN, Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, Singapore, Thailand. They were the founding members of ASEAN. Now, 1984 was very important because the Brunei Darussalam then joined uh, ASEAN on 7th January 1984. Later, with time, Vietnam on 28th July 1995 joined ASEAN. Then later, Lao, PDR and Myanmar joined on 23rd July 1997. Cambodia joined on 30th April 1999 and all these interesting facts about evolution of ASEAN from its founder members to you know this increasing number of members uh, have been you know collected from the ASEAN website do visit that is www.asean.org now let's understand what have been the aims of ASEAN now these aims also give us an insight or as to what are the driving factors for countries to come together and agree to cooperate with each other. 
that is to accelerate economic growth, social process, cultural development in the region through joint endeavors in the spirit of equality and partnership in order to strengthen the foundation for a prosperous and peaceful community of Southeast Asian nations. So what you see here is that today the foundations of a regional organization like ASEAN have been based on the idea of shared goals and one of the shared goals is that prosperity occurs when you are united together owing to the geographical proximity. Followed by that in order to promote regional peace and stability through abiding respect for justice and the rule of law in the relationship amongst countries of the region and adherence to the principles of United Nations Charter. So what you see here is that ideological things also bind com countries together. For example, uh, you know, respecting each other's law of the land, not interfering in each other's territorial integrity and sovereignty, uh, respecting sovereignty and all these uh, have, have a parallel corollary to the United Nations Charter also. Then we see that to promote active collaboration and mutual assistance on matters of common interest. Now what are these common interests? Economics, social, cultural, technical, scientific, administrative skills. All these are part of the ASEAN paraphernalia. So what you see here is that today countries in order to cater to the idea of peace in their uh, around their borders in order to cater to the idea of security in the land and of course uh, you know adhering to the uh, parallelly to the larger principles of united nations at the same time working ensuring to collaborate on issues that is economics social cultural technical scientific and administrative fields too so Another organization, a regional organization that demands merit, dear listeners, after having discussed NAFTA and ASEAN is the SARC. Let's understand. The South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation, SARC. Now, when we look at the establishment of SARC, the signing of the SARC Charter in Dhaka on December 1985 was the basis for the formation of SAR. Now, let's look at the member state members who comprise uh, the SARC Union. Uh, there have been eight members. Let's understand Afghanistan, Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, Maldives, Nepal, Pakistan and Sri Lanka. Now, the secretariat of the SARC Association was set up in Kathmandu. This was in January 1987. Now, again to understand, uh, you know, what have been the objectives that really get got the countries together to formulate SARC, the objectives of the association and for this we will be referring to the SARC charter. So, whenever we try to understand any organization, a regional organization, an authentic source of primary data, an authentic source of understanding the first word value we uh, refer to their portals, to their online resources, wherein when we look at SARC, it says that the objectives of the association, when we refer to the SARC charter are to promote welfare of the people of South Asia and to improve their quality of life and to accelerate economic growth. At the same time, social progress and cultural development in the region and to provide all individuals the opportunity to live in dignity and to realize their full potentials. The SARC attempts to work to promote and strengthen collective self-reliance amongst the countries of South Asia to contribute to mutual trust, understanding and appreciation of one other's problem, to promote active collaboration and mutual assistance in the economic, social, cultural technical and scientific fields. Once again, all this understanding of SARC, we have referred to the online portal. That's why we have even given the online resource reference so that learners and uh, all the listeners can refer to it in order to understand the recent developments that, that have been taking place in the management and working of SARC. 
Now, when we, when you know, we saw NAFTA, we read about ASEAN, we read about SARC. This brings us to an important question: Who are the actors that are taking, you know, part in regional organization? The actors are the states, regional institutions, societal organizations, and other non-state actors. Now, all of them come to share certain fundamental values now all this becomes very important for us because you know when we look at that how today collaboration is just not limited to the status perspective there is plurality there is diversity there is cross connection and this is why we move beyond the states and this is why regional institutions societal organization and other non state actors are also involved at various levels of cooperation and coordination in mechanisms that regional organizations employ at the same time that they share certain fundamental values now these actors also participate in a growing network of economic cultural scientific perspective diplomatic avenues political uh, forums military avenues amongst others now when you we look at this uh, regionalization and of course we've debated globalization also with this dear listeners let's come to understand how are regionalization and globalization related what are important aspects herein i will quote to you a, a quote by uh, middleman from his work and let me let's present that if globalization is regarded as compression of temporal and spatial aspects of social relations then regionalism may be understood as but one component or chapter of globalization now uh helping national economies in order to have a competitive edge in the world market in order to instill multilateral cooperation on a global scale adoption of liberal premises about cooperation all these that are significant variables in globalization are also present in regionalization so therefore you know if you we really go by the views of mitelman it is definitely seeing a strike balance or maybe you can say contra, a contrasting parallel that is globalization is space time compression then regionalization is a component of the space time compression that is visible at the geo political apparatus level so therefore this entire debate as how today countries are coming together in order to have better competitive edge in the world market how there is a debate on multilateral cooperation on a global scale how you know the adoption of liberal premises about cooperation all of this are being factored in the analysis of world politics so therefore if we go by that earlier premise therefore if globalization is space time compression then regionalization definitely is a component of it whose impact is felt at the uh, geopolitical certain geopolitical region now uh, you know uh, with the opening of local economies if you we go by this parameter then holman sorensen also say that is globalization then may be expressed through regionalization so therefore globalization and regionalization then if you track them in the trajectory of world history therefore they are parallel now next important that is regionalization challenge or response to globalization very important for us to understand now there are certain important issues for us which we have to think and these questions we presented to you we hope that you will try to invoke these issues these points of analysis in your future uh, course material also that is is regionalism a means towards something else other than globalization very important for us to understand that is regionalism and globalization you know is it leading to something more than we have imagined for or something more what the narrative offers then 
we have to see that the division of the international economy into mega regions for example the north america the north americas the europe the european union uh, the east asia what kind of image are we having for the world affairs when we see these mega regions cooperating on their own then this brings us to an important question that we all must uh, discuss that is can regionalism lead to a more pluralistic world order so here we go that uh, an example that we present to you the european union now as you all know that europe has been the main focus in the world history the first world war was between the pan european powers the second world war was a completely you know uh, uh, in the europe but of course it had escalated to even powers outside europe even during the cold war the usa and the ussr were trying through marshall plan through warsaw pact in order to reconstruct europe and establish their domination now at the same time you know you know the european coal and steel community played a very important role to bind regions together that is eu with its strong supra national powers today is no doubt the one of the most advanced political macro regions now other macro regions too definitely show degrees of political cooperation they show degrees of unification but their political strength generally lies in the degree to which member states act collectively so what you see here is that european union which was a supreme example of supranational governance supreme example of pooling in of sovereignty today european union from the maastricht treaty to the brexit has come a long way and therefore we have to think as to what are the new challenges that are that lie ahead in creation and sustenance of creation and sustenance of the uh, regional organization agreement so with european governments losing or ceding control of national economies their constituencies are turning to keep to the market for help so here are two parallel and related processes that have emerged that at one point european governments are losing or ceding control of national economies and at the at the time the constituencies are turning to the market for help now very important to see here is that uh, one is regionalized regionalism and other is globalization and here i quote to you uh, an example that i have read in the foreign affairs article to let's understand that it, instead of working through nation national capitals today european regions are linking themselves directly to the global economy so here in is a different picture that european union which has come a long way from european coal and steel community via the maastricht treaty a common currency a common trade zone but at the same time when you look at the how today economies are tapping in the benefits of globalization that is at one point we have regionalism and at the other we have globalization and instead of working through national capitals european regions are linking themselves directly to the global economy so here is again uh, some uh, some interesting facts that is you know united nations and security related uh, task today are being thought to be dealt at the subordinate regional institutions why number one they are comprehensive they are covering wide range of issues second they are multi purpose that is today be it be scientific be it be social be it be cultural these organizations offer a platform so therefore when we look at you know regional organizations such as asean they are an example as to how today security related tasks and other subordinate regional institutions are being dealt through these mechanism now when we look at the au when we look at the eu when we look at sadc all have all these organizations have some type of institutionalized mechanism for conflict management this lays the foundation and the groundwork for increased regional cooperation too now 
what you see here is that uh, when we look at regional organization, regional organizations have had a history and this history, this brief historical trajectory becomes important in order to understand the previous issues. Now, today when we look at how regional organizations are playing an important role in certain non-traditional security dimensions too, we have to see that you know old regionalism if we are to say was morally about trade blocks it was about trading agreements it was more mostly in the nature of commercial and economic interest earlier regional organizations were in the format of what can be sort called as economic communities now this idea of old regionalism trade blocks, economic communities existed you can say roughly in the 1950s and 1960s. They were inward looking, they were protectionist. Now when we look at mid 1980s, there has been strengthening, deepening and widening of regional trading arrangements. So therefore here we find new channels of cooperation. Here we locate new avenues of uh, together that how what draws country together that uh, there has been strengthening deepening and widening of regional trading agreement so therefore when we look at the single market of the European Union when we look at East African community when we look at North American free trade agreement when we look at uh, the AMU the Arab Maghreb Union all of it somewhere are having avenues of cooperation which is just not limited to the economic Today, these issues, these organizations are having multiple levels and nexus of cooperation. So, therefore, when we look at APEC, Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation, when we look at ASEAN, Association of Southeast Asian Nations, all of these are examples for us as to how countries are getting together to cooperate with each other based on geographical proximity and same time factor in benefits. So, another examples of regional uh, organization, let's trace it for example, we have the Caribbean community, the CARICOM, we have the COMESA that is common market for Eastern and Southern Africa, we have the Mercosur that is Southern common market or all of it are examples what draws countries together. We have discussed about SAG that is South Association Association for Regional Cooperation. We have seen Southern African Development Community and of course the West African Economic and Monetary Union amongst others. Now what are the similarities uh, when, when we say that is regional economic integration project should be about it should be market driven. So therefore, the focus of regional organization is outward looking, that is remove obstacles to free movements of goods, services, capital, investment within a region as well as to the rest of the world. Then what we see here is that today new regionalism, if we can coin this term, is being embraced because of old multilateral, because, because there is a feeling that old multilateralism does not work long anymore. So therefore, new regionalism is look, being looked upon as a viable risk management strategy. New regionalism is being looked upon as a coping strategy for many states and at the same time because it is seen that regional arrangements provide an opportunity for the market access also. Now, when we look at this entire paraphernalia again of regionalization with globalization, there are two things which are very important for us to understand in order to track the contours of the global world politics. First of all, it tells us about the inadequacies of the old Westphalian state system. The state is no longer the only unit of analysis. State is competing with non-state Actors. So, when we look at as to how the international global order has come, be it be from uh, realism, that is survival, leading to state citizen to self help, to you know the liberal order which said no, that states ought to compete, not just compete with each other, states are here to factor in their 
trade interests also. Or when we look at how this entire debate between the real, uh, realists and the liberals later translated itself into the new new debate. Now, this new new debate is very important for us because the new realist scam would say that states just focus on the absolute gains, whereas the new liberals pointing out towards Robert Cohan and Joseph Nye's idea of complex interdependence, that is, multiple levels of hierarchies. Then, at the same time, there is dilution of interest. And this multiple levels of hierarchy, dilution of interest, and this entire division between high power and soft power getting blurred gives us an imperative to understand that today regional and global cooperation amongst the state is coming up. Cooperation is cutting across borders because somewhere non-traditional security dimensions are just not in the nature of military. Today, non-traditional security dimensions cut across all the borders and these demand the certain kind of an urgent action which make, makes it imperative for regional and global cooperation amongst the state. An example, let me quote, quote in for you here, HIV AIDS. Now, there were this outbreaks of severe uh, acute respiratory syndrome SARS. Now, when we hear about HIV or when we hear about incidents of SARS, you know, pandemics like SARS, uh, these examples are something that show a window that is global challenges that have distinct regional characteristics. Now, these challenges, they, how are they being addressed? And when we look at what is essential to note here, that they are addressed by responding to regional problems. So therefore, gradually, regional cooperation is also developing because today cooperation is no longer about just crude army, navy, military issues. Today, cooperation is gradually developing. So therefore, when we see that, you know, uh, countries get together to co you know coordinate and cooperate with each other in order to ma uh, manage SARS or in order to look after HIV AIDS or to look after any, 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 other, any other kind of pandemics. So therefore, the four forces of context makes it imperative for uh, countries to look into regional cooperation. So uh, there are again you know degrees and levels of regional uh, cooperation and which later we can see in the form of a regional organization too. Let us uh, take them one by one. We have a custom union wherein members impose common external tariff. Okay. Then custom union when it union if you stretch it further we have a common market. A common market has features all the features of a customs union with the elimination of obstacles to free movement of labor capital and other services. Then customs union followed by that we have an economic and monetary union wherein we have a common currency and the harmonization of monetary, fiscal and social policies. Now at the same time there is complete economic integration that is the final stage. Now this economic integration presupposes that economic and political policies are Unified. So, therefore, when we try to study, uh, you know, uh, regional organization and the process of regionalization, I would request the listeners and the uh, reader, uh, learners alike, that is, trace examples of a customs union. Try to understand how a common market works and is geography a basis to get a common market work together. Then, economic and monetary union what it actually takes to harmonize the monetary, fiscal and social policies of various countries. Uh, idea of complete into economic integration, that is the final stage, that is how do you ensure that economic and political policies are unified. Now, this brings us to an important aspect, that is causes of regionalism. What makes countries to think, to collaborate and cooperate with each other? First is that is normally overcoming problems related to collective action, then uh, ensuring supply and provisional of transnational public goods. Today, uh, you know, as you all know, that collective action demands certain kinds of trade-offs, certain kind of understanding of the challenges of present time. Regionalism is definitely one of the driving forces. Today, public goods are transnational. For example, uh, look at climate 
today look at environment it's a transnational public good water so today countries are coming to come cooperate with each other on a common geographical regional plane to ensure supply and provision of transnational public goods then of course looking into the issues of resolving interstate issues looking into the aspect of transnationalized conflict and the entire debate of overcoming fragmentation with effective utilization of factors of production and resources you know the entire debate that uh, unity is a strength so therefore regional organizations try to factor this in their attempt to resolve you know interstate issues transnational conflicts and of course they want to avoid duplication of effort they want to avoid wastage of resources so therefore in order to overcome fragmentation and ensure effective utilization of factors of production and resources other factors that uh, are one of the drivers of uh, regionalization economies of scale the very idea that together we can make the pie bigger together we can contribute to many areas of the world economy better pooling of resources and the very idea of ensuring larger and more competitive markets is definitely one of the driving forces of regional organization at the same time looking at the fact of increase foreign investment that is today regional organizations think that together when they are united as a voice they can drive out they can get foreign investments better now same time that is capital flows credibility of national reforms through lock in policy mechanism transnational political coordination and governance all these are very important when we try to understand regional organizations now what are the barriers to regional organizations first is that is uh, there are unfavorable external conditions somewhere you know there are factors that emerge that makes cooperation a difficult affair lack of support and development from partners and external agencies there are times wherein you know regional organization come with a big agenda big aim and purpose but some way they do not perform well because there is lack of support from the development partners and external agencies too then there are historical issues too by historical issues and by, by historical issues we understand that certain countries may not be able to get their talks narrative on the paradigm of cooperation because of a uh, historical deadlock then there are conflicting diverging political economic social and cultural political uh, systems then national sovereignty is an issue that at times when countries get to decide together you know issues are overlapping and if one country compromises much then this might lead to more amount of issues for the other then there are conflicting interests identities policy agendas that definitely are uh, you know act as a barrier to regional organization per se then there are power asymmetries within the region uh, that often act as a roadblock in a uh, roadblock in the uh, you know functioning a healthy functioning of a regional organization there is underdevelopment there is poverty there is lack of capacity and at the same time there is unequal and uneven distribution of cost and benefits of regionalism and then there are dysfunctional regional and national institutions that definitely have an impact on the mechanisms and on the processes that go in in order to sustain a regional organization now so this brings us to an important question in our discussion that if we were to ask that when states oppose regionalization when you know when we look when states see regional and subnational integration framework limited in terms of their mandate in terms of intervention domestic jurisdiction and the exercise of sovereignty so therefore when we see that you know if states find that regional organization are too much interfering or somewhere they're casting a doubt on their domestic uh, sphere of influence and somewhere putting a question mark on their national interest and sovereignty states definitely oppose regionalization then now regionalism and nationalism this is very important to understand that new regionalism that we discuss is not very different from that of the 
all security alliances. Today, member states that uh, see frameworks of regional integration, they are looking at them as a means to pool and increase their national power resources. So, therefore, uh, regionalism and nationalism then definitely go hand in hand. And when we try to understand that how then when country gets better benefits in terms of its regional cooperation, definitely the feeling of pride for the nation is definitely enhanced too. So, it is very important to see that when we are trying to look at uh, regional organization, we have to look at both the aspects that what drives nations together, maybe transnational political coordination and governance. At the same time, we also have to see that joint cooperation on policy mechanism. Then looking at historical issues, looking at unfavorable external conditions and looking at lack of support from development agents, partners and external agencies could be some of the regions that are barriers. Now, dear listeners, when you are trying to look into uh, you know issues of regionalization, always try to see that uh, today uh, regional organizations have manifested various forms. We have discussed idea of a customs union, common market, economic and monetary union, complete economic integration. It is important to understand how these factors, how it really works in order to for the larger operation of regional organization. Then when we look at that how regionalization is a fact of life of the world politic politics right now, it tells us about how Westphalian state system is also witnessing change and at the same time that there are imperative for regional and global cooperation among the state. So, therefore, when we look at you know outbreaks like HIV AIDS or SARS, all of this, there are global challenges with distinct regional characteristics. So, therefore, it is important to address to them by responding to the regional problems and therein regional organizations and regional cooperation is gradually developing. So, therefore, to conclude, uh, yes, definitely regional organization are having an important say and an important stake in the world political system. Today, regional organizations, they are parallel, they are complementary, yet sometimes in contrast to the process of globalization also. There are various barriers to what drives nation towards regional organization and regionalization and also there are drawbacks also there are you know that really stops nation. What is essential for us to see here is that regional organization and the process of regionalization per se has come a long way from just being limited towards economic integration project. Today, uh, regional organizations are also about free movement of goods and services. They are also about non-traditional security dimension. They are about cooperation on transnational public goods. They are about cooperation on new dimensions of security threat. Every regional organization varies its own variability of success and failure. For example, SARC may be very successful. Then at the, at the time, APEC. Uh, maybe have been successful in some time, must not be in other areas. So, therefore, we have to look at regional organizations from their own contextual perspectives that drive the factor features and the forces. So, therefore, you know from trade blocks to economic communities that exist in 1950s and 1960s, today there is one of the significance of the understanding regionalization and regional organizations that there has been a strengthening, deepening and widening of regional arrangements. And these regional arrangements are not just about trading, they are also about new forms of collaborations that have come forward. And of course, the debate that is uh, globalization and regionalization is here to stay because there is no clear cut picture that if at one point of time is globalization a, you know or regionalization a challenge or response to globalization the debate is on and therefore we have to think about it that globalization may be expressed through regionalization in terms of opening of local economies, in terms of adoption of liberal premises. But at the same time there is a debate that is regionalization leading us to a new kind of a much more pluralistic, 
diverse world. So, dear listeners, do listen as we conclude the lecture. We like to uh, request you that do refer to the online resources of the websites of regional organization NAFTA, ASEAN, SARC, APEC, EU. Very important for us because this gives us a better perspective as to how the world politics is you know having new contours as we try to map it from the end of the cold war to the dawn of new phase of globalization and of course regionalization and regional institutions working side by side to that.